And you're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2, and we are in London talking with British authors, and joining us now is author and historian Simon Sebag Montefiore, whose most recent nonfiction book is Jerusalem, the Biography. Mr. Montefiore, if I may start with a quote you have in the front of your book from Amos Oz. And this is the quote. Jerusalem is an old nymphomaniac who squeezes lover after lover to death before shrugging him off her with a yawn, a black widow who devours her mate while they are still penetrating her. <laughs> what does that mean? Why did you include that? Well, I mean, that, that um, Amos Oz quote very wittily captures the fascination of Jerusalem and why Jerusalem has such a magnetic draw to, to everyone in the world, but also especially to me, why I wanted to write this book. I mean, Jerusalem is a lens through which you can write a history of the Middle East, a history of the world almost. And the exciting thing about it, it has actually been conquered by just about every single great civilization you care to mention, you know, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the, the Romans, the Greeks, Alexander the Great, and, um, and going right up to the Turks, the British, and now the Israelis. So in every way, it's, a, it's, it's just a, it's a fascinating place. It's a fascinating gateway, if you like, to, to see the history of the world. Is Jerusalem strategically located? How did it become so vital to so Absolutely many people? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's, not. it's not strategically valuable at all. It became strategically valuable when it became a great city and a great fortress. But actually, it's far from the trade routes. When, when, when armies um, are invading up and down, uh, invading Egypt or e if, if from Egypt invading into, towards Syria, they march up the coast, as Napoleon did too. There's another one I didn't mention. And, um, and they don't go anywhere near Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is irrelevant. Jerusalem is all about holiness. Its, its value comes completely from the, it's, it's a temple city and its prestige um, as a capital uh, and as a name in history really comes from that for, for that, for that reason, from its sanctity. That's all about religion. When did it begin as a city? Well, it began, you know, uh, it began in sort of probably the sort of second millennium um, before Christ, at least, um, and um, it started as a, as a, as a probably as just as a small uh, mountain top uh, fortress, just with water, a spring, and a mountain top. And of course, in those days, high places um, were often holy, but and to have a fortress, um, you often build a fortress in a high holy place, and it needed to have a spring. And that's all Jerusalem had. There was nothing special about it. What made it special, and has made it special throughout its history, has been the decisions, the whimsical, capricious decisions of a few men. And it was David's decision to, um, to use this kind of Canaanite shrine, um, use this fortress, to be, rather like Washington, D.C., a neutral capital between northern and southern tribes. It was that decision um, he could have chosen somewhere else. He didn't. He chose this place. And that was the beginning. Um, of, of the special the special nature, the special sanctity of Jerusalem. Did it ever serve as a neutral capital? Never. No, there's nothing, ever, nothing been neutral about uh, Jerusalem ever in its history. Um, Jerusalem has a special power. Um, it's one of those places, I mean, first of all, it's unique, one of the unique things about it is that everyone feels that they know Jerusalem. Everyone feels there's an authentic Jerusalem. And everyone feels that their authentic Jerusalem needs to be built in Jerusalem if it isn't already there. Um, so that's one thing. Everyone feels that Jerusalem is their sort of other home city, as somebody, as somebody I think Teddy Kollek once, once wrote. Um, but the other strange thing about it, it is it's a city, in most cities people want to live there. If they conquer it, they're happy for it to have many different peoples in it. But Jerusalem has always... Um, uh, has always uh, uh, sort of infected its conquerors with a, with a wish to, to own it absolutely, exclusively. And partly that's a religious thing, because if you believe that owning Jerusalem is the gateway to salvation, to Judgment Day, to, your, to, the, to, the, to the salvation of your soul, then of course it's hard to compromise about Jerusalem. You want to own it absolutely. You write in Jerusalem, the biography, in Jerusalem, the truth is often much less important than the myth. That's right. I mean, in Jerusalem, if you're writing history of Jerusalem and writing this book, is the most exciting and the hardest thing I've ever done. It's, it's been a sort of a nightmarish challenge in a way. Um, but, but if you're writing about Jerusalem, 
the myths are often more powerful than the facts. As a historian, I want to write about the facts. And in this book, regardless of the agendas of all the ethnic groups and all the religions um, and all the politics, um, I've tried to, um, to, to tell the truth, to get as close to the facts as I can, even, if, even when deeply inconvenient. Um, at the same time, the myths are often the things that have changed history more than the actual facts. So one's always writing a history of both. Oftentimes, the facts matter less. I mean, for example, the Via Dolorosa is the most famous Christian um, uh, road, I suppose you'd call it, in Jerusalem. The road where Christ is supposed to have carried his cross along the Via Dolorosa, the, the, the road of sorrow. But historians now think it extremely unlikely that it was that the, actually the right route. Why? Yet, yet um, they think um, it's actually the route to the wrong, to the wrong um, location of Pilate's palace. Um, it's explained in the book, but um, the geography is explained in the book, and there's no point in explaining it here. But basically, um, it may well be geographically the wrong place, historically. Does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Because millions of Christians believe that this is a holy place. And holiness, and this is one of the themes of the book, what makes a holy city? A holy city is a place where man can encounter the divine, can meet God, where, God, where, where, where divinity is especially intensely present. That's definitely true in Jerusalem. But um, part of divinity, part of holiness, part of it is a heritage, a pedigree. So one of the features of Jerusalem, which is most interesting, is all these holy places have been made even more holy because somebody else finds them holy too, or somebody else found them holy before we did. And that's the fascinating thing. You know, so the, the, the holiness is redoubled, intensified, trebled, quadrupled. And you know, there's, great, um, there's a great sort of instinct to use the, the, the stories, um, the holiness, the very stones that have stood in somebody else's victory arch, somebody else's temple, somebody else's palace, um, the buildings the, of, of an earlier conquest of an early religion, and to use those things in your own stories, in your own new um, revelation. And that's one of the fascinations of Jerusalem. When you look at it, people often say, how do you write about Jerusalem? It's layer upon layer of history. But it isn't. The history is completely interwoven. Um, and it's much more like a tapestry. It's impossible to unravel. What's another one of the myths of Jerusalem? Um, gosh, there are, so, there are so many of the myths. I'm just trying to think. I mean, another one is the, um, the Jewish tomb um, of Simon, of the, high, of the supposedly an early, early high priest, Simon, um, Simon the Good, um, that, that almost certainly um, is, in fact, the tomb of a Byzantine woman. You know, that's another one. And for the Muslims, there are umpteen things that are absolutely, um, you know, absolutely mythical. So it, it goes across all the religions. And what are some of the more important holy sites in Jerusalem? You well, mentioned the, the Via Della de Rosa. Yeah, I mean, the key sites, I mean, the, the key site, um, the first site, the key site is um, the Temple Mount. That's the center of it all. That's where it all happens. And what happened? Well, the, temp the Temple Mount is the place where Solomon built um, the Jewish temple, first temple, and his own palace stood there. Um, and when, when after that was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586, um, a second temple was built there. And this temple was then rebuilt by Herod the Great. And when Herod the Great rebuilt it, he built the most magnificent temple and the most magnificent city that Jerusalem's ever been. Even today, it's not so magnificent as it was then. And that's the temple, Herod the Great's temple, is the temple that Jesus walked in. So it's one we're very familiar with. Um, Herod the Great, by the way, was one of the most fascinating characters in the book. He, Why? He's the biblical Henry VIII, if you like. And the, um, the Herod dynasty are the, are the um, biblical Tudors and Borgias, if you, if you can imagine that. Um, Herod the Great, he's also the Jewish Stalin, the, the, the Jewish version of Joseph Stalin. He is a fascinating character, um, subtle, brutal, a dictator, a mass murderer. He married 10 times uh, more than Henry VIII. He killed three of his own children, which Henry VIII never did. Um, most interesting thing is he killed the w woman he really loved. Herod the Great was a mongrel. 
in the sense that he was half Jewish and half Arab. So he was a perfect mixture. Um, but the Jews didn't...